All right, five, seven. We are on to our last section, which is split into two pretty different pieces, actually. What we're doing in five, seven, part one is we are talking about further transcendental functions. If we haven't talked about this before, transcendental functions are basically non-algebraic functions. So your exponential, logarithmic, trig, things like that. Um, anything polynomial or rational, those are called algebraic functions. So transcendental functions, the first thing we're going to talk about really briefly is an alternate definition of the natural log function. And we've actually played around with this a little bit with antiderivatives already. But one definition is what we talked about, probably even in algebra, um, that it's a, it's a power function. It's the power on e that gives x as an answer, because you know natural log is log base e. A second definition is a calculus-based definition. All right, and that would be this. So natural log of x is defined as the integral, starting at 1 and ending at x of 1 over t. So remember, our interpretation of an integral is the area under a curve. So if we want to know the area under this curve, and a function 1 over t looks something like this, just like a piece of a rational function, and then it's got these two lines, vertical, horizontal, asymptote. So starting at 1 and then ending wherever. All right, starting at 1 and then ending at x. So if we plugged in x to the natural log of x, it would give this area that I've got highlighted right here. So the area from 1 to 1 would be 0. Um, if I went from 1 to e, it would be the natural log of e, which is 1. So you can see how this is defined in more of a calculus way rather than an algebra way. So, for example, if we were to do this, the antiderivative of 1 over t is natural log of the absolute value of t. The reason we throw in absolute value is because we're not allowed to plug negative numbers into a natural log function. So we just have to guarantee that we're not going to get a negative input. So we throw absolute value there. We go from negative e squared to negative e. Alright, so we've got the natural log of the absolute value of negative e minus the natural log of the absolute value of negative e squared. Okay, so we're just going to simplify this up. So, of course, the absolute value of negative e is e, and the natural log of e is 1, minus the natural log of negative e squared. This is just 2. It's like the pow what power on e gives us e squared, and that would be the second power. And so this ends up giving us just a negative 1. All right, so even though we've, we've actually worked with this already, that the antiderivative of 1 over t is natural log of t, or 1 over x is natural log of x, just kind of an official definition here. All right, so um, we are using these derivative formulas that we already know. Like We knew that the derivative of 1 over t is the natural log, and so we can know, I'm sorry, the derivative of natural log is 1 over x, and so we can use these derivative formulas that we've got to come up with some antiderivative formulas. So if you remember these, the derivative of sine x, remember, um, sine has square roots and subtraction. Tangent has neither. Secant has square roots and subtraction. And of course, if you remember, secant also has the absolute value of x because secant sucks. So we have those three formulas that those should be review. Hopefully you remember those from our derivative chapters. So that implies that if I wanted to take the antiderivative of this, I would get sine inverse. So we're just going to rewrite all these formulas. And then, of course, plus c. We're always going to have a plus c. Um, we don't have a specific different one for cosine because cosine is just the opposite. So if we were taking the antiderivative of negative 1, we would just throw the negative out front and make it negative sign. So it actually kind of keeps it a little bit easier. We only have three rules to keep track of. So the antiderivative of this, don't forget your dx, is tangent inverse plus c. And last one, the antiderivative of 1 over, of course, the absolute value. Don't forget the dx is secant inverse plus c. All right, so just going off of those derivative formulas that we should hopefully remember from first semester,
So example two, we are basically, we're taking these things that sort of kind of look like one of these three formulas right here. We're going to do some substitutions, some u substitutions like we just did in that previous section. So this one right here, example two, it's going to be definite integration. We'll play around with this once we do our u substitution. We basically just want to figure out which one this looks the most like. It's not going to look exactly like one of these, um, but it's subtraction, so we know it's either sine or secant. There's a square root, so we know it's either sine or secant. And just the form that it's written in, you've got your variable stuff all under the square root. There's nothing outside like that, so we know it's supposed to fit the form of sine. Okay, so let me walk you through basically the problems that we have so far. Problem number one. This is a one. This is a four. We need to make this four into a one. The best way to make a 4 into a 1 is to divide by 4. So we're going to start with that. So this is just going to be a lot of manipulating, a lot of simplifying. So under the square root, we're going to factor out a 4. So if I factor out a 4 here, I'm left with 1. Minus, if I factor out a 4 here, I'm left with 25 over 4. Okay, and then dx. You can put the dx right here, or you can put a 1 right here, and then put the dx on the side. It doesn't matter at all. Okay, next thing. This, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this and try to not write every single step down. So follow what I'm doing here. So that's 4 that's underneath the square root. I'm going to pull it out. So we know a 4 that's under a square root is actually a 2 because the square root of 4 is 2. And because there's a 2 in the denominator, I'm going to pull it out like this. Okay, so that's where I'm at so far. Hopefully you followed that. The 4 in the denominator was under a square root. Square root of 4 is 2. 2 in the denominator, I can pull out a coefficient of 1 half. Okay, so that was the next thing I did. Now, this part right here. In my formula, is just supposed to be something squared. So if you're trying to figure out what on earth could I do to make some sort of substitution, let me show you. For the substitution, we know that we want this thing right here to be just like a u squared. Okay, so if we want 25 fourths x squared to be a u squared, just take the square root of both sides and you'll figure out what your u substitution should be. All right, so 5 halves x is what we're going to swap out for a u. And then remember, we do that whole du dx thing. So the derivative of this, we say that du equals, derivative of that is a 5 halves dx. Now let's look back at what we need to replace. This stuff that I circled is going to get swapped out for a u squared. The dx, we don't have a 5 halves dx, we just have a dx. So multiply both sides by 2 fifths, and this will tell you what we need to swap out. Okay, so now the dx is going to get swapped out for a 2 fifths du. The 25 fourths x squared is going to get swapped out for a u squared. This is really similar to yesterday's stuff. You need to figure out how every little thing can get replaced with something in terms of u, including the bounds. Okay, so that's the important part as well. So this is equal to, let's set this up. So negative 1 fifth, if I were to plug that into this equation right here, 5 halves times negative 1 fifth ends up being a negative 1 half. 1 fifth times 5 halves ends up being positive 1 half. All right, now let's sub everything else out. Okay, so we're going to look like this. Underneath the square root, I'm now going to have a 1 minus u squared. I saw that coming. That's why I made the substitution that I did. Now, in terms of constants, let's, this equal sign is a little too close. Um, I have the 1 half that was already there. Now times, now I'm replacing this dx with a 2 fifths du. Okay, so now everything is in terms of u and nothing is in terms of x. Okay, so now let's take the antiderivative. So out front I'm going to have a 1 fifth and then the antiderivative of this is sine inverse of u. And then I'm going to evaluate it from negative one-half to one-half. Remember from the last lesson, the beauty of doing definite integration is that you don't have to sub back for x. We did the subbing for x in this step right here. Okay, so I've got one-fifth 
times sine inverse of one half minus one fifth times sine inverse of negative one half. Now, if you remember the way sine inverse works, you're trying to figure out what angle gives you a sine of one half. So we can kind of undo our unit circle hand trip. Oh, that's a big hand. Um, sine is just one finger below, so it must be this angle right here that's a pi over six. These are going to be the pi over six family members that give you a sine of one half. So one fifth times pi over six and then minus one-fifth, the angle that gives you a sign of negative one-half is negative pi over six. All right, so we got these nice values right here. So this is gonna be pi over 30 minus negative pi over 30, so that's a two pi over 30, or a pi over 15. Okay, so that's our answer for that one. So I know these ones get a little bit crazy. All right, let's work through example three. We are looking for a substitution that we can make. We're comparing it to the options that we have for inverse trig, and just the addition tells us that it's gonna be tangent. All right, so tangent, we're supposed to see a u squared plus one down in the denominator. So the guess that we're gonna make is that for our u substitution, we're gonna use x squared. All right, so if u is x squared, u squared would be x to the fourth, so that would be a u squared. Now, this lonely x right here is actually part of our correction factor. So if u is equal to x squared, that means that du is equal to 2x dx. We have an x dx that we need to replace right here. This, I'm going to take it and divide both sides by 2. Okay, so now I can make all the necessary substitutions here. So my integral becomes this x dx gets replaced with a 1 half du over x to the fourth becomes a u squared plus one. Okay, so now it looks just like this. Okay, so I just take the antiderivative, I get inverse tangent. I have a one half out front, I get inverse tangent of u plus c. Since this is indefinite, I do have to sub back in for that u. All right, so I get one half tangent inverse of x squared plus C. Okay, so you can see I got some definite, some indefinite. The process works the same. Um, we're looking for the substitutions. We're trying to figure out how to make it equal to one of these three values. Okay, so on to the back. Fifth example here, we got a lot of craziness going on. We got the natural log of cosine inverse over, and then we have cosine inverse times the square root right here. So lots and lots and lots of things going on. We're actually going to end up making two u substitutions. The nested function that hopefully you notice is cosine inverse, and cosine inverse's derivative is actually present right here, or a constant multiple of it anyway. All right, so the u substitution we're going to make is for cosine inverse of x and du, the derivative of cosine inverse, is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx. But since I don't have a negative here, the only difference is I'm going to multiply both sides of this by a negative. So multiply the right by a negative, multiply the left by a negative, and that's the substitution I'm going to make. So let's set this up. So I've got the natural log of u over this cosine inverse gets replaced with a u. And then this thing that I have boxed up, circled right here, that's this thing right here. It gets replaced with a negative du. Okay, so that was our first substitution. Now, like I said, this one is a little bit crazy. We do need to make another substitution. So I'm actually going to do this second substitution in a different color, just so we can kind of keep everything organized. So this right here, if we are looking for some sort of substitution to make, the substitution that we're going to make is actually going to be for natural log because natural log's derivative is 1 over u, which is right here. Okay, so we're going to make a w substitution, if only we were all in class in person, so we could see how funny that was. Natural log of u is our substitution, and dw is equal to the derivative of natural log, which is 1 over u du. So we have all those pieces right here. This piece is right there. Okay, so now let's make our substitution, rewrite the integrand. So we've got the negative, that's still part of it. Natural log gets replaced with a w, and then u du is getting replaced with a dw. 
Okay, so now this is much simpler. So we're going to take the antiderivative of this and then start to back substitute. Okay, so there's going to be a negative out front, and the antiderivative of w is just a 1 half w squared, and of course plus c. So making our substitution, this is equal to negative 1 half. We're going to sub back in for u, or I'm sorry, for w, and w is the natural log of u. So natural log squared of u plus c. This notation, like when you square a natural log, the square goes in the middle just like it does with trig. Okay, now we're going to make one more substitution. Negative 1 half natural log squared of u is cosine inverse plus c. If we were to try to take the derivative of this, it would require a double chain rule, which is why going backwards and taking the antiderivative involves a double u substitution. The more complicated the integrands, the more complicated the, the antiderivative is going to be, and this is pretty complicated. All right, example six. This is going to be kind of a welcome break here, I would assume. If you're looking at this one, um, first of all, maybe a context clue that it's the one that we haven't seen yet, but also we've got square roots and subtraction. The variable comes first, and we've got this random variable on the outside. All right, so this is going to fit with secant inverse. The substitution that we're going to make, this thing right here, the 25x squared is supposed to be just a u squared, if you go off of our formula. So u squared is what we're going to sub out in place of the 25x squared, which means, since I just want to talk about u instead of u squared, that means u must be equal to 5x. All right, so if we replaced every 5x we saw with u, then we would end up with a 25x squared would get subbed out by u squared. All right, so that means du is equal to 5 dx. All I have here is a dx. I don't have a 5 dx. So that means that 1 fifth du is going to swap out that dx. Now, if I'm looking in here, the dx has a place to go. It's going to get swapped out by a 1 fifth du. This 25x squared is going to get swapped out by a u squared. This x is the only thing that we haven't talked about yet. So make sure when you're doing these substitutions, you figured out how to make everything transfer into a different variable. This x, we're going to use this formula right here. If u gets replaced with 5x, that means that x can get replaced with 1 fifth u. Okay, so now we can make all of these substitutions. So, integral. The dx gets replaced with a 1 fifth du over the x gets replaced with a 1 fifth u. Square root of the 25x squared gets replaced with the u squared and then minus 1. Okay, so that's our antiderivative. Before we take, I'm sorry, that's our integrands. Before we take the antiderivative, notice that we have a 1 fifth out front and a 1 fifth in the denominator. Those are actually going to cancel each other out. Last thing that I'm going to have here, when I take the antiderivative, this fits perfectly with secant. Um, the only kind of weird thing that we have going on is the fact that we don't have an absolute value. Okay, so I'm going to account for that in the last step. I'll explain it in the last step. I promise it'll all kind of work itself out. All right, so when I take the antiderivative of this, I am going to get secant inverse of u plus c. However, because I don't have to, or because I don't have that absolute value right here, I have to guarantee that the only values of u I'm plugging in are positive values of u. If I had negative values, I would need the absolute value. So because I don't have the absolute value here, we can only say that this antiderivative works for values of u that are positive. Okay, that's how we're accounting for the fact that there isn't an absolute value right there. All right, so last thing, since this is an indefinite integral, we are going to sub in our expression for u, which is a 5x plus c. This means that 5x would have to be greater than 0, which is the same as saying that x has to be greater than 0. All right, so let me explain that domain restriction one more time. We see that x has to be greater than 0 because our secant formula is supposed to have an absolute value right here. Since our integrand doesn't have an absolute value right here, it still comes out to be secant. We just have to restrict our, our domain to values that are strictly greater than 0. Otherwise, our formula would be messed up because we don't have the absolute value. If we only put in positive values, we don't need the absolute value. So that's why the domain restriction is there. Okay, um, very quick couple more transcendental formulas here for e to the x and b to the x. So e to the x, it's the best derivative ever. Why wouldn't it be the best antiderivative ever? Antiderivative e to the x is also e to the x, but of course the plus c. 
And then b to the x, the way this works, I want you to be reminded by this formula. We have this constant of, whoops, natural log of b before the bx. I mean like a weird h or something here. Just ignore that. It's natural log. This is our derivative formula. So think of this. When we're taking the derivative of natural log of b, we multiply by natural log of b. So when we're taking the antiderivative of natural log of b, we divide. And I can show you, actually, kind of prove it for you. Let's take this and take the integral of both sides. OK, so if we take the integral of both sides, the antiderivative of the derivative, remember, you end up with just a bx. And then here, this constant, I'm just going to throw it out front, and then times the integral of bx dx. If we're trying to get this part by itself, which we are, we would divide both sides by the natural log of b. So that's why the antiderivative of bx is 1 over natural log of b times b to the x. But then, of course, plus c. So it comes from this right here. If we took the derivative and then took the antiderivative of both sides. All right, so just two more formulas to have memorized. This one, obviously, shouldn't require memorization. And this one isn't far off from the derivative formula. So quick example, 3 to the negative x. OK, we're going to make the tiniest little u substitution here. Um, our formula doesn't have a negative x and it has a positive x. So we're going to sub out a u for a negative x. And of course, we have to make substitutions for everything so that the entire anagram is in terms of u instead of in terms of x. So du is equal to negative dx. Well, I don't have a negative dx. I have a positive dx. So that means that negative du will be equal to positive dx. And then my bounds. OK, so the last thing I'm going to do is going to plug in my bounds. So if I plug in 0, u equals negative 0. That's still just a 0. And then here, if I plug in 1, u equals negative 1. That's my new bound right here. Then I'm going to sub everything else in. OK, so 3 to the negative x becomes 3 to the u. And dx gets replaced with a negative du. Now, one thing I want to remind you guys of. This is technically integrating from right to left. From 0 to negative 1, I'm integrating backward, but I have a negative on the outside. So one of my properties says I can switch, go back to going left to right, and get rid of the negative. All right, that'll make our calculations a teeny bit easier. All right, so now going up to this formula that I still have on the screen, the antiderivative of 3 to the u is 1 over the natural log of 3 times 3 to the u, and then we're going to evaluate that from negative 1 to 0. All right, so let's plug that in, see what we get for our answer. Remember, with definite integration, we don't have to sub back in the x stuff. So we got 3 to the 0, and then minus 1 over the natural log of 3 times 3 to the negative 1. All right, so simplify this up. 3 to the 0 is 1, so this is just 1 over the natural log of 3. And then minus 3 to the negative first is 1 third. So that means we'd have a 3 down in the denominator here. All right, there's always going to be algebra that you could do to simplify this even further, but I know you guys aren't big fans of simplifying, so I think we can probably just leave it at that. Okay, one last one here. This is going to be one last u substitution. This fits with this formula again right here. When you're doing u substitutions, remember you look for a function that looks like it's physically nested. That would be the t squared function. So we're going to make a substitution for t squared. That means that du is 2t dt. We come pretty close. I have a t dt, but not a 2t dt. So I'm just going to divide both sides by 2, it's kind of manipulating these constants. Then I'll be able to swap out all the t stuff for u stuff. So my integral becomes, instead of 5 to the t squared, I have 5 to the u. And then instead of t dt, I'm going to replace it with 1 half du. OK, so 1 half is going to be part of it, and then times my antiderivative, which is 1 over the natural log of 5 times 5 to the u, and then, of course, plus c, because it is an indefinite integral. So finally, I'm going to sub back in my u, which is t squared. Combine these fractions up, these two right here, times 5 to the t squared, and then plus c. So that is my, you know, lovely antiderivative there. OK, so we've just got one more section after this where we're going to talk about some general integration techniques.